I'm here today to introduce our speaker today. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Milton Clymer to you. Now, Milton, or Milts, is currently the owner and CEO of Senior Market Sales, or SMS, which is a successful insurance brokerage company located here in Omaha that employs nearly 200 people in the Omaha area alone, more than 12,000 agents nationally. And Milt is also a prominent philanthropist in the area who supports many causes, such as the Salvation Army, the Institute for Holocaust Education, and several other Omaha charities. Now, before coming here today, some of you might have read about Milt or heard about his book. But if you haven't, you should know that Milt is a man with an amazing story. And with genocide still taking place in the world today, his story is now more important than ever. Now, Milt was born in one of the worst times in history. But despite this, due to great sacrifices by his mother, he was able to survive and eventually come to America. Now, despite coming here at the age of 14 without knowing a word of English, Milt was able to finish high school, attend college, serve in Korea, host his own radio show, and even organize his community in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, against a neo-Nazi group that had risen up, before finally settling in Omaha, becoming a successful businessman. Now, originally, when Milt's did not tell his story for many years, not even to his family. It wasn't until his grandchildren visiting concentration camps in Poland began to ask questions that Milt decided to write things down. Now, at first, he didn't think anyone besides his family would be interested in this. But, due to insist the insistence upon his family and after being approached by the Institute for Holocaust Education, Milt was able to publish his book, Red or Death, in 2014. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Milton Kleinberg. Introduction, I can sit down and take the applause, right? <laughs> uh, how much time do we have? We have at least an hour or an hour and a half. Oh, good. I don't know what you're talking about. No, whatever <laughs> you're comfortable with. Uh, what we will do is uh, I'll make my presentation and then I will ask questions and answers. So don't be shy about this. Anything you can think of, I have the answer. I could be the president of the public uh, How many of you have read the book? Oh my goodness. <laughs> that means that you can see, you can keep track of what I'm telling you is correct. <laughs> because I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, give you a uh, Tom Sketch description of the book. And from the book uh, that you have already read, uh, you can keep track and see if I'm telling you. Or, or at least if my memory is still good enough to do this. Uh, I want to welcome you all here. You are coming at the most opportune time in history. History is repeating itself. I would have never thought that in my 80 years I would be standing before people and telling him that the Holocaust is going on. The Holocaust is going on in the Middle East and in Northern Africa. The radical Islamists are the new Nazis. They're perpetrating exactly the same atrocities that the Nazis did. Their thinking is the same. They're copying the propaganda that they passed on. It's the same. Except the Nazis based their hate Mongery on uh, nationality or about, on race, but the Islamists base their hate on religion. Now, I want to make clear that not all Muslims are the same and that not all Muslims are hate Muslims, but the radical Islamists are. They organize, they get their hate right away from the Quran. They want to replicate what happened during World War II. And uh, Iran in particular has declared that they want to wipe Israel off the map. And the fact that they are going to get a nuclear weapon, Israel is very concerned about it. And they should be. Because once a tyrant tells you he plans to do something, they do it. Evil exists because good people let it exist, but they don't do anything about it. 
And I was, I was, uh, I was born in 1937. On January 28, 1937, and Bobby needs born. It was absolutely the worst of all times and the worst of all places to be born a Jew. Hitler was the Chancellor of Germany, and he was beginning to rant about the Jewish question. On, uh, I think it's November 1938, he organized his uh, ranches, and they had uh, attacked Jews at all the stores and Jews broke all the windows in it. And that night is called Crystal Night. means night of broken windows. They rampaged through the streets, they broke the windows, they beat up people, and they, they and this was a state-sponsored, organized program. And, uh, and of course, at the same time, uh, Hitler was getting ready to invade Europe. On September 1, 1939, the German army invaded Poland from the west, and the Russian allies invaded Poland from the east, divided the country in half. And the river boat was the demarcation line. A lot of people don't know that at the beginning of the war, Russia and Germany were allies. It was later on when things have changed. The, uh, the German army, when they invaded, they invaded with a force called the Blitz, Blitz, Blitzkrieg, that's like thunder. They came across. Eight days after the war began, these, uh, the Nazis were marching in lockstep down the cobblestone streets of Poland and Pavilions. They immediately began repressive measures against the Jewish community. They burned down they, uh, they did burn out. They uh, destroyed the synagogue at Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year. If you don't know, if you don't know, you know it now. And uh, then they destroyed the synagogue. They also annexed Western Poland, and they call it Weatherland. So now, the part of Poland that we lived in we were part of Germany. One of the edicts that they announced is no Jews will be permitted to live in German territory. And they meant occupied German territory as well. So we knew what was coming up. That meant that it was going to be forced eviction. On a cold December morning, German troops surrounded our street. It was called the Leeds Sepulch Chain. Name of the street and forcibly evicted us. They came up with bayonets and rifles, knocked the doors, and forcibly threw everybody out. We had less than an hour to grab what we could carry and we could get on the street. On the street, they lined us up four abreast and they marched us down to the center of town to the train station. At the train station was waiting for us a locomotive attached to about 15 to 20 cattle cars. The smell from the cattle cars was just horrific. It seemed like the cattle were just unloaded and we were taking their place. The Germans herded us into those stinky cattle cars so tight that it was barely enough to turn around. After 36 hours, those smelly cars without food, water, or sanitation. The train stopped in a city called Sibylsk, and we were ordered out. The cold air hit us like a slap in the face. But it was almost invigorating just to get out of this tight space in the cattle cars. It was sort of put the line back into us. For a moment, we forgot about our rumbling bells. 
then they marched us out to the Jewish section of town to a burned out synagogue. The synagogue was still smoldering. You can see, uh, uh, you can see the edges still, the smell of a burned out synagogue. Burning flesh was in the air. It was just overpowering. They asked us to go into the synagogue. And we were kind of reluctant to go in, fearful that once inside the synagogue, they will torture the synagogue without sinning. But the German soldier said, there's food, uh, there's bread and water inside, and it won't be there very long. So we overcome, we overcame our fears, we went inside. Inside we found space next to our relatives that were also and uh, once we got organized, we looked around. My brother, I was almost four, four years old there. My brother, Herschel, was a year younger. And uh, we looked around and we saw an elderly man with a white beard wearing a Jewish prayer shawl. Do you all know what a Jewish prayer shawl is? The little shawl, the shawl yeah. type thing that Don showed us. Yes. And he also had a prayer book in it. And he was walking around the burned out altar and talking out loud to an uh, invisible person. The people in the synagogue just ignored him because they know that his son and wife died in the fire and they thought he lost his mind. But he was just talking out loud arguing with an invisible person. Of course, my brother and I, we were curious, so we went up to the man and asked him who he was talking to. He looked, he looked at us in those piercing eyes and he said, the angel of death. And he said, but don't look for him, because no one but I can see him. And, uh, kept him walking around the altar. For two days we watched him torture and wrestling with the angel of death. On the third day he came over to my mother, gave her some of his belongings, wrapped up in a package. He took out some money he had in a white handkerchief and gave it to my father. And he told him, I won't need it anymore. Says, the angel of that showed me what the future has in store for me, and I want no part of it. No part of it. Then he put his right hand on my left shoulder, and he said, looked at my parents and said, in a very strong, resolute voice, you must go across to the other side, to the Russian side. There is still life and hope, but here there's nothing. Then he quietly walked over to the torched, uh, scorched floor at uh, the altar. He took off his jacket, he folded it up like a pillow, put it on the ground, and he folded his shawl right up and put it, folded it up, put it right on top of, right on top of the uh, his jacket. Then he quietly and carefully laid down the prayer book on top of the shawl. Then quietly laid down, rested his head on top of his prayer book, and said his prayer. And now, he, I don't recall him telling us his name, but I had many, many dreams about him. And in my dreams, he called himself Abraham. My parents took Abraham's words to heart. The next day they found a Polish border guard who had an old wooden flat bottom dilapidated boat and he bribed them so we could take across go across the river uh, to the Russian side. Now, I won't I don't have the time to tell you exactly that trip, but those of you who have read the book, you can see what happened. Those that have 
then we write a book, we have to buy a book to find out. <laughs> what happened? Well, we got across to the Russian side. Down there, we were arrested by the NKVD, which later became the KGB. And uh, NKVD gave us a choice. We could either become Russian citizens or be deported uh, with the other Poles. So, two, a few days later, they deported us to Yellowstone, which was a big holding place for Poles of all kinds of nationalities. Religions, and they were all gave up for deportation deep into Russia. We stayed there until um, February of 1940. 1940, they had a train waiting for us with boxcars. They were similar to cattle cars, but the Russian boxcars are a little bit bigger and the smell. We uh, were ordered. Those boxcars took us uh, by train to the to Arhangetsk. Arhangetsk is in the most it's north in the most eastern part of European Russia, right next to the Finnish border of Finland. That's a 900 mile journey. Arhangetsk, when we got there, was a small town consisting of wooden homes and wooden sidewalks. And we stayed as a family in a small house in a colhouse, which was a collective farm. Everybody had a job, everybody had to work, and uh, without it, you didn't eat. So we lived in that cold place. It's very difficult to describe. It's six months is winter, six months is summer, and uh, half, half the time is night and half the time is day. You just didn't know where you were. Uh, during summer, there was a little more food available, but at the same time, we were food to the mosquitoes. And they had the biggest mosquitoes they had. So, in there. But, anyways, just as we were getting used to the place, we got orders to pack because we are going to be relocated. In summer, spring of 1941, the Allies, the German Allies, uh, the Nazis, invaded the Soviet Union on a thousand mile border across the border. And they came from all directions. Uh, the war was again with the Flint Creeks, but they forgot about Russian winter. In the summer, the tanks and everything moved quite rapidly, but during winter things changed. What the Soviet Union did is they took all the manufacturing from, uh, from uh, European. Siberia, or we're moving into Siberia or Central Asia. So we were in Siberia and they were going to move us and others. The Russians uh, actually deported a million and a half Poles from all nationalities to slave labor camps deep in the Soviet Union. And uh, we were among those. This time, we were told to get ready for departure. Uh, we were issued passports with poles stamped on it and ration cards. A ration card entitled a person to 550 grams of bread, which is about a pound of bread, and less for children. That was not enough to keep body and soul together. So, Parents, like others on the train, have collected old trinkets and everything else so they can get off the train during uh, train stops and barter for food, supplement the restaurants. 
this time there was five of us. Uh, my brother, Benjamin, was born while we were in our young as the youngest. He was uh, a baby. So my mother was nursing very old. I was responsible for my brother, Herschel. And father was responsible for getting off the train and bartering for food to supplement the rest of us. The journey from uh, Arhangetis to Samarkand to Uzbekistan, we didn't know it at the time, but that's where we go now, is about 4,500 miles. That's about twice across the United States from New York to California. And uh, the Russians had built a Trans-Siberian rail line years ago, and uh, traveling on that rail line uh, under normal conditions generally would take two to three weeks. But we were not traveling during normal time. We were traveling when you need a pilot. People were shooting at us while we were traveling. The trains were moving back and forth. It was a slow journey. So that two or three weeks turned into three horrific months on the train. You can just imagine how bad it was. So he had to live on the, on the cattle car for three months, his family was. Three months. Well, when we, uh, in a place between, in Omsk and Novosibirsk, it's about halfway down. My father got off the train, bartering to barter for some food, and he never came back. So that means my mother, my two brothers, and I were stranded on the train. The worst part of it was that he had one of our ration cards, our passports, our money. So we were stranded there with no way to get a, even ration cards. We couldn't get any new ration cards because without passports, you get don't get your ration cards. Without ration cards, you are stranded. So we were really stranded on, on the train. The train was long and arduous, and uh, it was it was tough. However, a Polish woman on that train also had bad luck after she left Poland. Her husband died in Arhan yes, and she had uh, a younger boy who was about my age at the time, and he died in an accident under the train. She was devastated. But my mother, the friend of her, had helped her take care of the baby that she had in addition to her son. And uh, this time, came over watching her dead baby and she said to my mother, she gave my mother her ration cards and passport and she said, now you are me. You can use those ration cards to get some bread. And the Russians will not be able to tell us apart. And she most likely saved her life. However, it was too late for my younger brother, Beth last day on the train of malnutrition and typhoid. We, uh, the train, I think we had almost a month to go on the train. In the fall of 1941, the train stopped and a tall Russian soldier opened up the Lighting door on the train, and he yelled out, Welcome to Samarkand, the jewel of the Orient. Take everything with you because you're not coming back on the train. We were deported to uh, Samarkand to supplement the labor pool in the, in the area. The men were all drafted in the army, most of the women. Samarkand had two important commodities. We called it to save and to help the war. Tobacco and cotton. Uh, and my mother 
Douglas Bridge up and ended up in a cotton gym where they sat on bed, low benches and they picked out the seats from the cotton by hand. I don't know if anybody had any ever picked cotton. You know how tough that is, picking out the seats. The seats they make the oil out of and the cotton, of course, they make clothing out of it. I guess the cotton gym didn't get to Russia by then. I hope it's going to so that was a uh, difficult situation. In the summer camp, we uh, we had. I think my mother worked at that uh, cotton gin for less than a year. After that, she was lucky. She got. She had a friend named Kaya who also came from the same place. And she worked in a tobacco factory. And she encouraged my mother to come and work in a tobacco factory with her. The uh, tobacco work, factory work was also hard, but there's one good thing about tobacco. Tobacco is a good currency to barter. In Russia, if you had money, you were a capitalist, and you would look down on But to have a commodity that you part of it, or the two of them uh, developed a scheme where they would steal small quantities of tobacco, share it with the guards and the commissar, and that way they prevented from getting arrested and wind up in Siberia someplace. There, uh, so they managed to do quite well. And she was very helpful in providing the extra. From there, uh, I uh, read in a magazine that they had a Polish, specifically Polish children, uh, uh, kindergarten, or a school as they called it. And they managed to get me into that kindergarten. In that kindergarten, I came up. I met two like-minded boys, Fiora and Edmund, and the two of us opened up our club out in the back of the outhouse. And from there we schemed how to raid the orchard across the street, close to Black Rock, and how to raid it the west of the garden, which was a mile down. And that made us a team. And we worked. <laughs> we uh, were fearless, to say the least. But we managed to get extra food from, uh, from the orchard. And from the uh, one night we were hiding in the bushes next to the vegetable garden because we had to wait till all the workers leave. Vegetables from the garden. And all of a sudden, a fight broke out between an Uzbek and a Russian. And uh, he was back, picked his curb knife, and cut the Russian. The Russian reached in his pocket, grabbed a switchblade knife, and stuck the Uzbek for a beating him until he fell down. Dead. Then the Russian looked around to see if there was anybody watching. We were hiding in the bushes and couldn't, couldn't see us and threw away a knife. My friends wanted to run away as well. And I said, no, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to find that knife. And uh, one of my friends, Edmund, he went back, but the other stayed with me. And I found a knife, packed it up, and kept that knife. And that knife was a lifesaver for both of us through the uh, Most of, it's most of the most of you who were at the book know what happened, the rest of you again have to get a book to see how it happened. There's just a few, a few events that happened in 43 that might be of interest at the night of my center. One time we were walking on the Black Road 
and we saw a wagon, horse-drawn wagon, with full of apples. The wagon came a little close to the ditch, and some of the apples spilled into the ditch. So the three of us jumped into the ditch, and we put the apples in our shirt. When we got back up on the road, we saw on his back, riding a donkey. He was drunk as could be, barely holding on, and he's swearing about Russian in his back and making all kinds of noise. When he saw us with the apples in our shirts, he dismounted, came over, pulled my shirt, spilled my apples, and then he said in his native tongue, corruption means thief. I will tell the teacher to teach thieves a lesson or two. Then he pulled his curved knife, he swung at my throat, I jumped back and missed, he missed my throat, but he got me in the right arm there. Then he was going to grab the knife again. My friend, Fjodor, had a stick that he always carried. He hit to his back on the head, and his back went down on his knees, and he dropped the knife. As he, the knife, as he went to pick up the knife, my adrenaline kicked in. I grabbed my switchblade knife from my pocket and I stabbed it was back in the throat and then a couple of times in the stomach. And he went down. The sight of this is back shock in his eyes that he saw when, he, when I stabbed him in the knife. And the blood screaming out of his mouth, neck is something we never forgot. None of us forgot. And, uh, then, it was back somehow managed to pick himself up, pick up the knife, and go on, uh, get on the donkey. And the donkey with his human cargo walked down the black road and it stopped at the gate of the orchard when he was back to work. And then he slid off. And Milton, you were how old at that? You, you three boys were how old at that time? About six, six years old. Six or seven? Yeah, six. Six, six and seven years old. Seven. Who was seven? Anybody here seven? Anybody six? No. Anybody five? <laughs> I think of all these things he's experienced now, and he's he's only up to age. Seven in his story. Right. So, uh, a couple other things happened uh, during that year, but uh, one is our friend Edmund was kidnapped by a Russian soldier and we managed to rescue him. Uh, we also saw uh, a wagon of peaches where I went and stole a few peaches and we heard a couple shots go off. We thought they were just trying to scare us. Well, they scared us. Uh, by the time we ran to the children's home, took a look at the other says, men will be bleeding. He hit me on the right knee, but he missed the ball, so I was fortunate. Yeah. And several other things occurred. I mean, you, those of you who read the book know exactly. The war ended, and the war in, in Europe ended May 8, 1945. The war with Japan ended three months later. The kids in the, in the children's home, staff and everybody were deported to Breslau, Poland, all together. Wouldn't you believe it? I was reunited with my father. The only was only one catch. By then, he already had a wife and two children. And my mother was coming two weeks later to a very, very big surprise. As you can imagine. The 
the, uh, the city of Bobby Nitz, where I came from, was quote war. It was a Jewish town, a Jewish neighborhood. Everything was Jewish. Uh, had Jewish signs on the windows. You had peddlers. You had people, beggars. You had people singing in the street. The noise and everything. After the war, you couldn't find one Jewish base in the entire city of Bobby You couldn't find a, a Jewish sign in any place. Hell was gone. It is, although we were never there. A thousand years of Jewish history disappeared. But to add insult to injury, our Polish neighbors made it clear that Jews were no longer welcome. So as Jews have done hundreds of times before, that what was left with our shattered lives in the town. So from Poland, uh, we, we moved on to uh, my uh, mother. When she came back, she was devastated. She didn't know what to do. She was sitting on a bench in front of the only synagogue that was left there. And the synagogue had a bulletin board where people would come and leave notes, hoping to find someone that survived the war. Uh, she was there, and Aaron Kleinberg, whose name I had, uh, sat down next to her, also looking for his wife, because when he, during the war with the Russians, occupied the city, they grabbed him, they grabbed him into the army, and uh, he wound up in Siberia working on things. So they sat there and was looking for his wife and his two children he left behind. Nothing was going to be done. He did have a brother in Belgium. You know, and, uh, and they were sitting there and they were trying to figure out what to do next. First thing, of course, the mother wanted to do was to get a get, which is a Jewish divorce. In Judaism, you can't remarry. Anyway, she uh, was sitting with the papers from the rabbi, and the problem with my mother was uh, she couldn't read or write in any language, so she needed help, and Aaron helped her. And together they sat on the bench and they figured out what they were going to do for the future. So they decided to get help from the Jewish uh, agency. The agency uh, made it sure that we went across and escaped from West part of Germany. After the war, Germany was divided into four zones. They had the American zone, they had the British zone, and the Russian zone, and the French zone. And we ended up in the West Germany in the American zone. We stayed in uh, Poland for about, in Germany for about five years. We lived in several DP camps, which means displaced persons camps. One of those camps, these place persons came called Wasser out again. My father, Aaron Kleinberg, married my mother, adopted me, and then uh, my two sisters were born, Bessie and Goldie, and we were born in there. And then uh, we tried to escape from there to Holland and to Belgium to meet up with my uncle. But uh, we got caught and sent back to Germany. So we stayed there for until 1951 when they were starting to liquidate the displaced persons again. And then there we got a passage on a ship called uh, General R. M. Bledford. And from there, by ship, we came to America on May 14, 1951. In 1951, we had uh, a sponsor that we were supposed to go to, uh, I think it was uh, Boston. And when we got there, the sponsor died, so they found a new sponsor for us in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And by train, we went to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and to a happy life. You want to hear some more? Sure. So, so then when his family came, over to America, and they went to Ellis Island, 
right? Uh, did, did you go to Ellis Island? Yes, we did, but we didn't stay in Ellis Island. We came directly right. to the harbor. Okay. We and then, and then um, his host family was from Milwaukee. Right. And they, and you lived up there for a number of years. Yeah. Well, yeah, you can go on with your story. Yeah. We lived in Milwaukee. One problem I had when I came to America was I couldn't speak English. And worst of all, I couldn't write. I didn't read or write in any language because I was traveling around. All I knew was the ABC. Uh, I and three other boys who came there. Uh, we came in uh, May. Uh, yeah, May of 1951. And by September, I had to get ready for high school. We had a, a retired Polish principal who they assigned to us to teach us to teach us English to get us ready for school. Uh, and uh, she she was she was great. Uh, we uh, she told me right out. She says you don't have much of a chance to get. Very wrong. But she says, I never encourage anybody to lie. But in your case, I'll make an exception. So, what she did is she told me that if you tell them you never went to school, they put you in third grade, you're going to stay there forever. You get for it. And if you tell them that you finished grade school, you'll get into high school, maybe you'll be there six months or a year. At least you will have a she gave me a uh, dictionary and she gave me World Series by a well friend. And I was reading it and writing it, you know, and through a whole summer I was doing this. My father and I used to go down the streets and to read every sign and do everything we can to get some education. So when we signed I was signed up in high school. Uh, I had a good fortune. I was good in sports. And so they assigned a couple of kids to help and to tutor, to tutor you. Uh -huh. So you could um, participate in sports and keep your brains. Yeah. yeah. Quite frankly, <laughs> the first year they were very kind to me. Meaning, I, uh, on my own, I probably could. But uh, I didn't graduate this year because I was not a troublemaker and, uh, and uh, I was eager to learn, really eager to learn. Second year, I was a C student. But by the third year, I was a B student and I graduated as a B student in high school. After high school, I joined the Army. Served a tour in Korea, came home, found my lovely wife, we got married. And now we have uh, two children, right? Children, six grandchildren, and nine great grandchildren who live in Israel. Who live in Israel? Right. Okay. And uh, about 30 years ago, I had an opportunity to come to Omaha. Insurance company here, and uh, I bought the insurance company. And now we have a large company on 84th and Dodge, where we uh, have a couple thousand people. I mean, 12,000 agents around the country. All I can tell you all. Anybody else can do that you can do. All you gotta do is be willing to pay. And the price is study, work, or whatever you do, you can become good at it. Because you don't have to be uh, what your parents are under unless you want to be. You don't have to do anything that anybody else can do. Nobody is a victim. People ask me. How can I have 
succeeded being a victim. I tell everybody I never was a victim. I was one of millions of other victims. All you have to do is think positive. You know that you can do it. I told my kids, there's nothing that they can't do if someone else can do it. You just have to be able to do it. My, my daughter, Cindy, when she was 30, she was in love with this Nanya Kamenich, a gymnastic girl. She said, Daddy, I would like to be like her. I said, well, you can. She said, well, how can I? She's so thin. She does things so easy. I said, very simple. She, the only thing she has out of you is 10,000 hours of practice. She says, if you start practicing and you start doing fundamentals of it, after a thousand hours, you're going to be better than 99% of your friends. After 10,000 hours, you're going to be as close as you come to work. So, and that's the mentality. If you really want to be something, set your mind on, you can be it. In America, you can. No place else in the world can you do that. With my background, no place else in the world could I ask this. But here, don't be a victim. When people tell you you're a victim because of this problem or that problem, come on, leave Tell them I told you. Okay, any questions? Okay, so I have a friend who's back in the river and she had a question for you. She said, when you were, um, how was it like um, not to have a comfort of a home to stay? Like, how, how, how did it feel that you knew you didn't have a place, like a set place where you could go? Like you didn't know it was going to happen? Uh, that's a very good question. When you're a child, and everything looks negative, you're only thinking of two things food and survival. Everything else is your own. I mean, you're always looking for those things, but you don't think about them. You don't get upset about this. There are some people, when they are put in that position, they just lay down and die. They give up. They give up. But people don't have to give up. If you don't give up, little by little you find a way. There's always some way to It doesn't feel good, but you don't care because you don't know any better. And your mother probably drew from the strength that she knew she had to be strong for you, for her children. Yes. For you little guys. And um, it, in the book, Mill talks a lot about just all they would have to eat for a meal with their ration stamps and cards would be bread and buttermilk. You talked a lot about buttermilk, and that would be all they would have. And he wouldn't get enough bread to fill him up. He would have been given, given enough bread so that maybe his stomach wasn't actually hungry anymore, but he certainly wasn't full. Well, what we used to do is we used to raid the orchard garden and he used to steal fruit your vegetables, anything that was available, he would sometimes risk life and then to get it, but it was worthwhile. Yes? How did it feel to, like, lose your father and your uh, brother? <clears throat> well, my brother, Herschel, was a year younger than I was, but Maturity-wise, he was much, much younger. He was completely dependent on me. Or, uh, he would, uh, when he had a piece of bread in his hand, and the kids would pick on him. They would steal it from him. And uh, I would have to jump in there, get it back to him, or get into a fight. And I had plenty of fights. You kind of had to take on the 
role of being a bully. Right. You know how much you guys hear about bullying at school. Well, that was a case where he was forced kind of into to a bully role so that he could protect his little brother because the bigger bullies were always stealing his food and picking on him. My father told me when bigger guys pick on you, the first thing you do, you gotta, you can't let them push you around. First thing you gotta do is you kick him in the shins. I don't want to be telling you what, <laughs> why, but that usually ends it. If it doesn't end it, then you uh, actually do the, the scenario that you used to tell. The first thing you do is you try to talk yourself out of it. Because if you can, some people, you can talk yourself out If it looks like it doesn't, then you kick him in the shin. And if that doesn't work, then you run away. And if that doesn't work, then you stand and fight. Yes? Right now? No, when you were a kid, how many meals did they give you a day? How many meals would you get a day? Uh, usually uh, about two meals a day. Uh, some for breakfast and some for supper. Uh, yeah. Did you ever go back to Europe after you came to the States? Well, <laughs> and business. Soviet Union opened up, opened up the uh, archives so you can look for, for your family members. So there was a genealogist who spoke Polish, German, Russian, Hebrew, and 
he will, he said, he will take, he will strike the my, my uh, family. I was looking for the climber family, but he found in Israel my daughter Dolly's family, which I went to originally. So I found out in 2009, I found out that I have four half sisters and a half brother living in Israel. So I, I have uh, four children, I mean, four, uh, I have six grandchildren who live in Israel and we were going to a wedding that so we met together. And so I have four, uh, four sisters and two sisters here, so that's six sisters and two You didn't find your other family until 30 years later. Yes, and two or nine. Bill, a question that I had for you was on the back of the book, you have a picture. This is your passport yeah, that's picture. That's picture and that looks picture. like you're in a real nice suit and tie, right? Yes. Do you remember where the suit and tie came from? Was those and, no. and a DP camp in Germany. A DP camp, okay. Because most of probably your clothing, you talked about only having one or two pairs of socks and one pair of shoes and maybe one or two little pairs of trousers and two shirts, right? right. That would be all you would have. Right. And all these times that um, his family would be fleeing or be... be uh, ordered to move to a different city or community, all they would have, they wouldn't really even be suitcases, they would probably be like burlap bags or something, and that's what you carry your own personal belongings in. And so, in the DP camps then, would they pass, would they have hand-me-down clothing that once children outgrew it, you would have someone else's? I think. This was a special gift. A special gift, yeah, okay. My parents bought me because we were coming to Okay. And then another thing I kind of wanted to point out, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but um, when you fled Poland, your, your parents took personal things like silverware or things that they would be able to barter with and trade. Yes, when they, uh, when they went on the road, they knew that all the things that we received uh -huh. were better. Okay. Silver wire. And jewelry. Jewelry, watches, anything of that nature. And so, like that, if you'd have to leave, you would take maybe some of your nicest possessions, um, hoping that you would be able to keep them, but if it came, to a point where you needed food or you needed this necklace, what do you suppose you probably would do? It's like, okay, I think I could part with this because I would rather have a loaf of bread to feed my children. Well, in, in Russia, Russia was a very poor country at that time. Anything that looked like a bed, you can borrow. Uh -huh. Okay, and then um, a couple different times in the book, you stated that there was nothing normal or routine about any given day. I mean, the day just was there, and what would happen would happen. There was nothing, anything routine or normal about it. Was it hard for you? Once you got to America to develop habits and follow a schedule then? Well, when I came to America and I saw the Statue of Liberty, I became an American patriot. I've been so ever since. I never believed a lot of members to be in America. The opportunities that are here is overwhelming. I'm always so amazed that people who are born in this great land of ours are like it, complain about it. And to me, it's insane. But I have always been very patriotic. And, uh, and I 
tell people that, and they think I'm kind of silly, but that's what I am. I spent, I spent 22 years in the military at one time, and to go to different countries and see, you know, what we've got, you don't want to be able to any other place in the earth. Right. Prime example was when we was in Honduras trying to train the young soldiers. And I had some college students that was with me. And I said, never again will they complain about going to college and not having to try to find a meal to eat or enough money to buy gas for their car. When they see little kids down there that have huge mop bellies on them that are in total starvation, they drink, they wash their clothes, they bathe, they drink the water, the cattle drink them. You know, I mean, it's just. Terrific. I mean, yes, yes. Uh, young kids now, uh, I, I'm watching the election. And I'm not going to tell you what to vote for. We won't get into politics. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching the election and I'm seeing these young college students gravitate to Bernie, a socialist. They have no clue what socialism is. Socialism is the worst form of problem there is. Socialism starts great until they run out of other people's money. Um, is there one thing, there's probably many, but is there one particular thing that you can think about in your past that still sends a shiver up and down your spine? In what respect? Well, just... Fear or something? Yeah, I mean... The whole experience, I'm sure there's... Well, I, uh, I still, from time to time, wake up with a nightmare. You still do? Yeah, mm -hmm. like I'm back where I, where I was. But, uh, it's less, it's less and less. Then one other, uh, another question that I had, and I want you guys to make sure you ask if you have any questions, okay? But one question I had is, um, what is one thing that you would want my students to take away from our visit with you today? I would say that you have to take away that in America that everything is possible. That you can truly be what you want. All you have to do is think positively. You have to think what you want to be and be willing to go ahead and do work it. for it. The, the world belongs to the doers. You have to be a doer. You know, there's never been a horse that won a horse race that didn't get into the game and get started. You can always convince yourself, I can't do this. Or I never be able to do this. It's not true. You can do it and you will be able to do it, but you have to get into the game. But many are long, uh, long shots and horses won. A lot of people did think that they can be or do what they want to be, but they do it and they become successful. I really like that analogy. There's never been a horse that's run a race or won a race that didn't have to get out of the gate first. Right. They had to run hard to get there. Do you guys have any more questions? Do you have another one there?